further ado, here's uh, Nathan. Nathan is, has done over 11 startups, uh, being totally diversified between financial and tech backgrounds. He's got a little CPA, banker, CFO, and certified M&A, which I don't even know what that is. So <laughs> we got that. Uh, but anyways, without any further ado, Nathan, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. I've got a lot of slides, but uh, I've got a PowerPoint deck that you can that you can download. So don't worry about this. Uh, there is uh, this is done on uh, Google Hangouts on Air. So within about 10 minutes, when after we're done, there'll be a YouTube uh, video that'll be the, the whole presentation. I'm going to go back and trim it and enhance it a little bit, but generally you'll be able to see what we're doing. Are we okay? okay. okay. <laughs> Additionally, what I've done is to create some online resources about this topic because this is a very complex topic and I won't be able to really explain it uh, in great detail today. It took me about 20 hours to prepare for this uh, presentation. But let me tell you a quick story before, before I start. Somebody I know uh, had gotten into a startup, worked a couple of years on it, uh, got it funded, was a co-founder. And this person uh, had a trip in Europe on business, came back, and the co-founder, who was the majority, who was the entire shareholder, uh, announced that their term, their stock is gone, and they're out. Now, I don't want that to happen to any of you because it happened to me. So. Uh, there, this can be a serious topic. I really hope to have um, an interaction with you. But in terms of what's available afterwards, if you'll go to this link, you'll find the PowerPoint, the YouTube, and any other uh, questions that we have. So, What I drew on to do this talk were actual cap tables, capitalization tables, which is a math explanation of who owns what of the stock through the various funding rounds. Is everybody with me on what that means? Okay. Now, where's Rudy? Rudy? Rudy told me about this book about two weeks ago. It's called Slicing Pot. And this book impressed me so much that I totally changed my presentation. Because this book explained how you can slice the pie in a way that will make you more effective. So, ten dollar book, really, and I'll be referring to it. In this book was another book called The Founder's Dilemma, and The Founder's Dilemma it is written by a Harvard Business School professor, and he took nine thousand startups and he created some conclusions about what worked and didn't work and why. He calls them founders to limits. And what I would uh, draw an analogy to with this is for people that uh, bet on football games and no spreads, how would you like to have everybody you're betting against not know the spreads and you know the spreads? You won't win every time but you will win a lot more than the people who are just betting their gut. And so when you read The Founder's Dilemma, you are getting the point spread. You're getting that understanding of what has worked and what hasn't worked. This is my, one of my favorite books. I don't talk about it much. But if you're assembling a team for a startup and you have trust with, within the team, now, how did I feel when I when I walked in and I was at was uh, now I was going to issue my stock that week? So, uh, systematically building trust among your teammates is one of the most powerful things that you can do to accelerate your start. Okay. Now, you can't read this, but you can go back and look at. It. But essentially, a capitalization table has the stock being issued over time and what it's worth. The stock being issued over time, and the far right is what it's worth. We 
we think so. We think so. Yeah. Okay. Now, I, I looked for a place where, I, where we could get some resources that would really explain this. And I came upon this site, and it really tells the details, the mechanics of what you need to build your own capitalization table. Most capitalization tables, you can go next. Again, you won't be able to read this, but under each one of those tabs is a detailed explanation of the methodology that this site uses to create a capitalization table. So you'll be able to make something dynamic for your own situation. Now, this is also intentionally where you can't read it. But if you go to Google, to Google Images, and you uh, look for capitalization table images, this is what you'll see. They're all over the board. And I guarantee you, if you do a capitalization table that's in any way complex, you're going to mess it up if you do it in a spreadsheet. And when you mess it up and someone sees their piece of the pie and it's wrong, you're going to have some trouble. So don't do that. The top one on the left is the one to go with, in my opinion, until you get maybe more expert at it. Okay. Now, one of the things that this particular site does is that you can put your own assumptions in. So that's when you get to uh, working with it, that's how you're going to do it. You're going to create the rounds, the rolls, the valuations, how much cash is going in, and what it's worth. Next. Okay, now I'm going to have a little fun here. I want all of you to turn to someone close to you, just one person, you know, and I want you to guess something. Jeff Bezos from Amazon put $96,000 in Google. All right, so I'm going to take, I want you to take 15 seconds and tell me how much if he had held that stock, that $96,000 worth of stock that he got as an angel investor in Google, how much would it be worth today? Now, I want you to think, of, I want you to think about it in this metric. You've heard of uh, 5x return, 7x return, etc. So I want to, in 15 seconds, for you to come up with a number about the multiple return that Jeff Bezos got from him. So please uh, share the information. <laughs> 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 okay. All right. So, has everybody got a number? Two million. Right, we went, we're going to have a little guess here. Okay. Remember, it's not dollars; it's multiple. So, when you go into a startup and you're touting to investors, you don't really tout this because you can't say stuff like this. But if things go well, they might get ten times their money back, fifteen, whatever. All right, so I want everybody to raise their hands. Everybody raise their hands. Okay. All right, now, who said it's less than 10 to 1? Anybody? Okay, 20 to 1. Just lower your hands when they say 20. 30 to 1. Okay, 60 to 1. 100, 200, 400, 500, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000, 21,000. That's it. 21,000 to 1 return. Go to the next. Yeah, this is kind of a fun thing. Jeff Bezos put in $96,000. Here's his line on the cap table, boys. And he got a fully diluted 0.61% worth $2 billion today if he held it. All right, now. This is a, a fuzzy slide, but this takes us through, in a general way, what you might expect in terms of dilution. You start, founders start with 100%. We go to the next. They have an A round, which, let's say, dilutes 
gets 30% ownership. You create an option pool of 20% for the executives and the staff. Let's go to the next one. You have a round. The B round gets 20%. The A round guys get diluted. You uh, reload, it's called the option pool, it's 20%. Let's go again. C round. 20%, 15, 18, you reload to 20. So the founders, you started with 100. In this scenario, based on research, end up at 27%. Okay, so my conclusion about cap tables is don't do it yourself with spreadsheets. Uh, but you need to know the math. You need to understand how it's done and what it, what it uh, means. It, you can spend way too much time on doing these because it won't sell anything, it won't uh, make your site go faster or, or uh, really almost anything else. And it, frankly, it can cause a tremendous amount of dissension. We're talking about the value of the pie. So, that Rudy gave me is by Mike Moyer. Now, uh, yeah, last month, almost a month ago. And that was at Stanford University. <clears throat> and he was explaining what and so I encourage you to get the book, to, to look at his YouTube video, and included in the online resources is a slicing pie table calculator. And it's, it's worth the effort. So, I, so here's what uh, the, the author, Mike Boyer, says. You want to work hard now, you want to have fun along the way, and you want to pay out later. Now, ideally, what he calls a perfectly fair equity calculation is where your share, numerically, is the value of what you contribute Yes. How do you value sweat equity? We're going to do that. The uh, question was, how do you value sweat equity? And we're going to get right into that. Okay, so 67%, according to his research, 67% of the, of the startups create a fixed equity split. Now, it can be 50-50, 60-40, 80-20. There's four people. It could be 25 each. Uh, take it, I'll ask George. George, how successful are people that do 50 50 splits? He's got a big smile. He might want to stand up and say 50 50. <laughs> <laughs> They're lucky if it's 50 50. I like that. That's good. That's almost I like that. Okay. So let's go on to the next. So here are th things that happen with a 50 50 split. What if you want to quit? What if you do all the work? What if you bring in another guy? What if your partner wants to quit? There's a million other things that can go wrong. That's with a fixed split. Now, here's what's going to happen. This is math. On the top, your share is either more than you deserve, if it's a fixed split, or it's less than you deserve. Now, how are people going to feel about that? The ones on the bottom are not going to feel too good. And, and the whole concept is to make your startup work. Okay, so what he says we need is something that's perfectly fair, 
that rewards participants for contributions, that provides ongoing motivation to continue, continue contributing, and accommodates additions or subtractions to the team, and is flexible in the, in the face of rapid change. Okay, so this is called, not just him, but this is called a dynamic equity split. And now we're getting to your, to your question. All right, so you work hard now, you get what you deserve later in proportion to what you contributed. All right, now, this is the book. I, I uh, how many people uh, have a Kindle or read things on Kindle? A few, okay. Uh, for myself, I always get the Kindle, I may have this too, because when you have the Kindle, you've got the graphics. You can copy stuff. You can paste it. You can send it around. And as a, as a matter of fact, as we get to the next book, I've, I've really pasted in from the Kindle screen grab for this. For this. So I, I highly encourage this as a sidebar. When you buy your book from Amazon, uh, get, you, get you a real copy and get you a Kindle copy. Go ahead. Now, can you go back one? Okay. Now, what he calls this is a grunt fund, and, and a grunt is kind of you kind of get used to the term, but a, a grunt is somebody that'll do anything that's necessary to make work. It's kind of it's an army term, I guess. Anyway, so the the the, the theory of this is called the grunt fund. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Now, you asked what's your name? Spencer. Spencer. Okay. Spencer said, well, how do you allocate? How do you create a metric? And what he calls these metrics, those are not your words, but are theoretical values. These are the inputs that your team, before you get significant money, decide among yourselves about how value and equity is created. And it's not it's not as hard as you think. Remember, you got a methodology, you got a you got a spreadsheet to work with, you got an hour long lecture, you got the book, uh, and I'll and I'll actually get I'll I'll mention I'll mention this in a minute. So you're taking into consideration all of these theoretical values to come up with a theoretical theoretical value for the enterprise. Now that number is a meaningless number in itself. But what it does do is create the relative values between one owner and another. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. cool. All right, so the total is all the time that's been put together, all the resources, the money that's been put in, that creates your theoretical value. Go ahead. So on the Grunt spreadsheet, you, there's a tab for each person, and, and whether you put in your time uh, daily, weekly, monthly, probably more often is good, your time, the money that you're spending, but you've got an idea along the way of what people are accumulating. And there's also something that helps with this, and that is if you, if you, have, a, uh, if you have a specialist, maybe you've got a specialist developer, they're really good and you need them for a, for a, for a specific uh, period of time. This is a way to give them the amount of equity that really relates to their time without offending them or without overpaying them. Because oftentimes what we do as founders is that we don't want to offend someone, so we overpay them. And, I, and believe me, I'm not, I'm not complaining about that, but I am at the same time. Because as your CEOs of startups, you've got to keep that equity and give it out to the people that is going to make, make it happen. And I, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Go ahead. So this is, a, this is an initial uh, calculation. Go ahead to the next one. So the sales guy has come on, and his calculation, he now has a slice of the pie. And these other two, three folks have been adjusted. And that little guy right there, the grunt one at 2%, that's, that's the specialist I'm talking about. Right, go on to the next one. All right, now, this is so important because how you remove 
a grunt, a founder, a teammate from your uh, proposition will show what kind of person you are. And it'll show not only to that person, but it'll show to the teammate. And if we don't have some rules when we're trying to all pull together and work night and day to make something happen, if somebody gets mistreated, you're going to regret it. So, but sometimes things don't work out. So, Mr. Moyer has come up with a way to fire someone, to really cause them to remove them. You can remove somebody for these choices. You can remove them for a good reason. They did something, and he gets into what that is. They can resign for a good reason. Family, they got to move, whatever. They can be fired for a reason that's not, he calls it, no good reason. They can resign. Let's say you've got a founder. You need them. And they walk in. They say, you know what? I, I'm, I'm leaving. I know you got a VC presentation tomorrow, but I'm not going to be here. I'm leaving. So that's a resignation for no good reason, Gwen. So if you have someone who is fired for good reason who, or who quits for no good reason, you don't give them a uh, pie for their time. You ingest their other input amounts. And again, I don't expect you to know this, but I expect you to maybe go back and understand this methodology. You buy back the cash that they've had and you have a non-compete. Go ahead. Now, if you remove a good uh, grunt for no good reason or they resign for good reason, then you have a different ending. Now, uh, how many people uh, are concerned, are familiar with the term of pivot in a startup? Everybody? Everybody should be? Okay. You, you, we went through this uh, startup weekend. It was just lean startup machine, and, and that was the whole key is pivot. So whatever you're doing, most likely, uh, whether it's um, uh, ODO that became Twitter, or it's uh, any any other, no, I don't know what Bill Gates' startup was before uh, Microsoft, but it wasn't called uh, Microsoft. You're, you're going to have a pivot, and sometimes your grunt needs to leave. Maybe they're a specialist, and it's just not, it's just not there anymore. So you need to treat them, if you follow this methodology, you need to treat them right because you have fired them for no good reason. So they get part of their pie, they get their pie, they get a buyback at a theoretical value that's going to go. Now, go ahead. All right, so according to the author, what we get from this process is something that's fair, that rewards participants for contributions, that provides ongoing motivation for continuing to contribute, that accommodates uh, additions or subtractions to the team, is flexible and gets rid. He has a whole discussion about gators. It has nothing to do with the Florida gators. Uh, but he, he says the gators fight a lot. Let's go ahead. All right, so when you get to the point where you have real revenues, positive cash flow, a significant Series A investment, in other words, real money, then you just pay people and your grunt fund is, uh, is terminated at that time. Go ahead. Now, this guy, can you go to the next slide for a second? This is a really cool guy. His name is Clint Costa. I've never, I haven't met him. I don't know if Rudy has talked to him or not. But this is a grunt attorney expert. You can go back one. And for 50 bucks, he'll spend an hour with you, and he'll give you a template LLC or C corporation uh, essentially operating agreement, and you'll have the basis to implement the grunt fund. Now, what you'll get, and this is the actual agreement. It's uh, what is it? Four, eight. It's uh, it's uh, eleven pages. It's eleven pages. It is. It is a solid agreement. You can get this. You can take it to your uh, to your lawyer. You can get his advice for 50 bucks, a whole hour, and you can take it to your lawyer. Maybe you want to hire him. So the conclusion from this book, Slicing the Pie, is static allocations are trouble, dynamic allocations are fair, and you need a team working together by considering this kind of methodology. Let's see. How are we doing on time? Um, 
Okay, now, the next book, which was, I, read, I heard about in this book, is by a Harvard Law School professor, Noam Wasserman. And he uh, studied 9,000 startups. Okay, uh, 9,000 Let's see, that's 10,000 founders. It's fewer number of startups. But 10,000 founders over a 10-year period. Go ahead. <laughs> now, I'm going to go through and, and just briefly touch on these, because what I try to draw out were some key points that he made in the book and some examples. But his founders' dilemmas are around what he calls people problems, and even solo founders have these problems. You have to negotiate, in a founding dilemma, a trade-off between wealth and control. He calls it uh, king uh, or rich. King or rich. And Build in between building financial value and maintaining a grip on the steering wheel. And we're going to have some interesting conclusions about this. Now, remember, this is this is the uh, in advance betting line that you have to know more about some decisions that you need to make, and you will improve your odds of making good decisions if you really study the results of what he says. Because when we just give our opinions about things, particularly if we're not that experienced and, and we haven't done serial startups, and maybe even if we have, then you're going to be at a disadvantage. Because you can learn statistically what has worked and what has not worked. Go ahead. Okay, so I'm going to read this. Focus this discussion on founding of high potential startups. Now, his work is not about mom and pop. It's not about the small business. It's, it's not about the, 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 you know, somebody that builds something up over 20 years. This is about technology startups. Uh, it could be life sciences also, but let's, let's focus on technology. Go ahead. Okay. The major parts of the Founders Dilemma explore the dilemmas faced by progressively introducing new players whose involvement in a startup provokes difficult decisions that, are, that significantly affect the startup's direction and outcome. Everybody here that's in a startup, there's one of you, there's two of you, there's three of you. If you're successful, there's going to be a lot more people in the room. And progressively dealing, introducing new players, vendors, investors, employees, officers, departing officers, this is the challenge that you'll face. This is the founder's dilemma. Go ahead. Okay. So I'm going to just say... Setting the equity split in stone, which is called a static alloc equity allocation. Dynamic is what we're, what we're advocating. Setting it in stone without allowing for changes is one of the biggest mistakes founders can make. And I won't go into the rest of that, but <coughs> this guy is making a conclusion on studying 10,000 founders. And if you don't have a way to adjust that equity as you're going along, you're going to have problems. Go ahead. All right. Now, he uses an expression, king control versus rich wealth. Okay. This is a really key point. As you're, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to take a side How many of y'all know uh, Jonathan Taylor? Anybody? Everybody know Jonathan Taylor? Everybody? Everybody in this room should know Jonathan Taylor. Really? No one knows him? You know him. Hmm? You know him. You know who he is, right? So Jonathan Taylor, up until the WhatsApp guy that went to Lake Brantley, that's worth $2 billion now, up until he came along, Jonathan Taylor, who's really, he's doing a, a founder's talk, isn't he? I think he's doing a founder's talk. He's not, I'm sure. So he has done it. So Jonathan Taylor has done 18 startups. He's the most successful software entrepreneur uh, in, in the Orlando area. He looks to uh, accelerate startups with money bring him into his organization. I mean, you, you know Jonathan Taylor. I mean, you know him well, of course. <laughs> right. So anyway, Jonathan Taylor, when I heard him speak at Rollins about two months ago uh, at a CEO forum, he said, all right, the first thing you do with a startup is you set your culture. Now, what a ridiculous thing. 
Wait a second. He knows what he's talking about. He said it 18 times. All right, so the, the, the CEO, the founders, set the culture of the company. And frankly, mentally, if you want to reduce it to some simple decisions, if you're the founder or the founders, you're going to think of yourself as king queen, uh, or rich. And you're going, to, you're going to make decisions which will inure to you having control or making money. Now, you might want to say, hey, I'd like to be king and I'd like to be rich, like Bill Gates. Okay? There's not many. There's not many Bill Gateses that get all the way through the process and that are king at the end and rich as well. And the decisions that you make around control and wealth will uh, filter down to your organization because if you're a king oriented person are the are the team members are going to be more likely to all pull in no it will be less likely and frankly according to his research the, the people that want to be rich that are the founders, they don't have a keen mindset. And I'll let you explore the book to get into the research about why that's true. But it is true, according to his research. Go ahead. All right, now, this is, this is an example of what's throughout the book. And these are helpful graphics, decision trees. You know, should you be a solo founder? If you are, how are you going to deal with, he calls them the three R's, relationships, roles, and all words. Go ahead. So here's some here's some aspects. Uh, what is the uh, in maintaining control as a solo founder? Uh, a solo founder will want to maintain control. A, a, a call maximizing wealth or uh, wealth. A rich person wants to build a founding team to attract the best co-founders. Co they want to tap strong and weak ties to find the best co-founders. A king mentality is going to attract. Less less smart people, and some of you are kings, and, and you know that's the way you're going to do it. But I'm just saying that if you're if in the back of your mind, in the back of your king mind, if you if you're into wealth, you bet you should you should reconsider your. Uh, thank you. Go ahead. This is a small graph. Statistically, 40% uh, of, of uh, technology companies have two founders. Uh, 18% uh, have one. This is just a the number of founders in a company. Right. This is just this is just more advice. Building a founding team when the founder has important polls. Now, these are interesting things: human capital, social capital, financial capital. When people talk about capital, and they're always thinking dollars. Human capital, social capital, are. I mean, you got to know what you're doing. And frankly, you got to be able to, to sell it to people. Yes? Is there a correlation between your two founders and your solo founder? Is there a success ratio between the two? Well, uh, all of his research is, says that if you build a team as opposed to a, a solo founder, that you're, that you're going to be. Because if you're solo, man, there's going to be times where, where you're, uh, a friend of mine said, tell me, he said, I'm staring up at the ceiling. I don't know, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. I got my, my wife's here. Like the kids are in the other bedroom. I don't know how I'm going to make payroll. You know, all those things. So, my advice is pretty quick: build a team. That's that's my advice. Right. I'm not going to go into these details. I do encourage you to go back and, and study this. Right, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. So, my conclusion from the founders' dilemma is respect and learn the data. Make a decision about whether you're going to be solo or whether you're going to try to build a team. In your heart, you know, decide, try to decide whether you're a king or whether you're interested in building wealth. Because what, you, what he says in the data is that if you say, well, I really want to do both, it turns out you're less likely to accomplish either one if you do a hybrid, he calls a hybrid approach. Mm -hmm. 
this is one of my favorite favorite uh, books ever. Uh, how many of y'all are familiar with uh, Stephen M. R. Covey? M. Stephen M. R. Covey. Mm -hmm. Okay. How many are familiar with Stephen Covey? Is there anybody? Mm, okay. Well, cool. Stephen Covey wrote one of the most blockbuster books ever written in business. He died last year. Stephen Covey. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He published it in 1991. Uh, it's timeless. He has 12 kids or 10 kids. One of them is Stephen M. R. Covey. He's about my age. He's younger than me because I'm older than everybody. But maybe you, I don't know. <laughs> Not everybody. Not everybody, okay. So Stephen M. R. Covey, about six or seven years ago, decided to study the concept of trust and the value of trust. And as you're building this team, and if you'll study this material, I'm going to the next one, and there is a, there is a uh, uh, free, there's a, in, the, in the online resources, you'll find this book summary, which you can also obtain from SoundView for free, and explains the theory behind uh, the, the speed of trust. And it's around behaviors, and it's about how to deal with people that you trust, that, that you don't trust, that trust you, that don't trust you. This is fantastic material. And as you're thinking about creating a culture in your startup that is authentic, that is not just based on whim, and that not, doesn't change from week to week, I would really challenge you to study this material. And I think that you'll find that you would agree. If you're if you're into wealth, not necessarily king, but if you're into wealth, I think you can find that you can adopt these wholesale. And that's what his research, and I come, keep coming back to this. Research, research, research. Find wise stuff and implement it. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right, so I, I'm, in, I'm at the end of my uh, presentation. What I will do, and I've done it with Rudy, I believe, uh, is that if you, I'll offer you a free 30-minute uh, consultation about anything that we've talked about on a Google Hangouts on air, not, not on air, excuse me, private Google Hangout, uh, so that it's convenient for, for both of us. So I, I, really, I really encourage you to get this book, to get the Dilemmas book, to study this for your startups and to come up with your own strategy to implement your, your startup. And let's go on. This is really interesting. And it totally comes from anywhere, from nowhere. This guy is Tony Buzan. Does anybody know who he is? Does anybody know who he's yeah. All right. Tony Buzan uh, won. He's, a, he's written, he's sold 8 million books. My he, he was a... Yeah, I've read so. Okay, so it's old, though. he's a... He's a uh, he's not as old, yeah, he's older than me, old golly. Uh, so anyway, he, uh, he has written a book on memory. And this little graphic is one of the neatest things I've ever seen since I've got a little time. And this is cool. This says that... From the beginning of a learning experience to the end, your comprehension of what you have learned is influenced by these factors. Interest, primacy, understanding, association. This is called a Van Rosdorf uh, event. This is a gestalt. This, that's recency. And if you will think, if, if you'll take a look at this, this is a bonus here. If you'll take a look at this and you'll think about the way you communicate with people. And, and the goal is to drive them up over time while we've been learning this over the hour. And I've, I've tried to do this. I didn't say we're going to do an association right now. Uh, or I'm, I hope you have a, a gestalt moment. Maybe you'll have to decide that yourself. But if you, as you decide how to present your ideas, if you'll be aware of what increases comprehension and you're giving your pitch, and you keep this in mind, I think you'll be in good shape. So I think we're about done. Awesome.
Um, when you were talking about uh, king versus wealth, yes. is there, um, have you read anything about social enterprise, you know, how that would sort of fit in, you know, where you're out to make money, but it's your, your stakeholders aren't necessarily the founders, but more Well, the I, 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 that's a good question. So the, the question is, uh, in more of a social enterprise that's not necessarily wealth driven, that may have a higher goal, I think if you find that the um, involvement of the team and the participation in the wealth side of things will uh, lead your organization to be more successful in in uh, get growing. Yes. I think you said um, one of the slides to figure out the value proposition of the people who are bringing in, how much they're contributing, what they're contributing. I guess, what do you do if you're confronted with people who you don't understand technically the work that they do? Because right? okay. there will be a lot of people who get okay. that. So the question is, if, you, if, you're, if you've if you if you got a technical person with this book, what they say is you, you start with an hourly rate. You say to someone, well, what, what's your hourly rate? And then you apply a multiplier to that because they're in a startup and they may not get paid. Or, or let's say their let's say their hourly rate is $100 an hour and it's uh, 2,000 hours a year. That's $200,000. You're paying them $75,000. You go through a mechanical calculation to back into the equity allocation, uh, but you you try to go back to the point, and it's the job that they do. Uh, for instance, I can I can mow the lawn, I can take out the trash, but I can't charge $150 an hour which is my rate, my consulting rate, to do that. It's got to be, you got to be doing what you're paid to do. Does that make sense? Anything else? You talk about culture? Yes. Establishing culture up front? Yeah. What would an example be? I think the trust, the, the, the trust cards, the, the trust behavior, deciding whether you're going to be uh, a king or you're going to be into wealth. Okay. Uh, Deciding whether you're going to implement something like slicing pie instead of uh, a static equity al allocation. But would it would it relate to like personality type of culture also? I mean, uh, it could. I'm probably not. Uh, you know, I'm probably not uh, an expert on that. I don't really know. Yes. Question: What do you say about the uh, illusion? Of yes. The yes. Uh, say we had the third round. The investors who come in now, like, let's use for instance, I love the show Shark Tank. When you have those investors who come in and they said, they're okay, we're getting a 33% of your existing company with that now. That means everybody who was in before, they now get covered into the 33%. Right I know, uh, no, the, the math goes like this. With each round, let's say the 30% number that you've talked about, your ownership percentage before that round is what it is, 10%. If you uh, create a 30% round, then your ownership percentage is going to be diluted by 30%, or it's going to go from 10 to 7%. So with each round, the dilution, and dilution is a it is a uh, term, it's kind of a derogatory term, uh, really, and it's very common that people use it in a way, but you are bringing people on that you don't have to pay to get them to live night and day on your project. So, again, king wealth. What are you, you know? What are you going to be after? And let me say this: I don't know. I don't. I can't pull out what the failure rate is of startups. But boy, it's high. Doesn't mean you shouldn't try it. You should. You should try it because it's very worthy. But you're probably going to try it once. And if you're successful, you're going to try it again. If you're unsuccessful, you're going to try it again and again. And so, don't burn bridges. Don't try to don't try to squeeze your team and take advantage of them because believe me they will find out and, and you'll suddenly look around and they're not around anymore. Gee, my team's not here. Anything else? So speaking of your team, uh, transparency is kind of a big thing uh, that's really getting more and more common and uh, helps build team culture. So would you say that? Like a, a spreadsheet that the whole like be, the whole company wide, even if it's a startup of less than five people, being completely transparent, and letting everybody know where everybody stands on that. Yes, I, totally, to totally. I would say that, and I would really challenge you to try to do this. Try.
try to create a methodology with slicing pie. And, and I'll jump around to uh, the, one of the 13 behaviors that Stephen M. R. Covey says, one of them is called straight talk, talk straight to people. And then another one is transparency. And, and if you'll go through and you will, uh, in fact, I've got this. These are totally cool. These, this is, this is uh, Stephen M. R. Covey's trust deck. So, 13 behaviors, talk straight, res uh, demonstrate respect, create transparency, right wrongs, show loyalty, deliver results, get better, confront reality, clarify expectations, practice accountability, listen first, keep commitments, extend trust. This is good advice. And this is a guy that studied it, just like these other guys have studied. And I, I really encourage you, in fact, I've got, I've got in the online resources, I've got these cards. You can, you can turn around. Anything else? Um, just because uh, you were talking all around it, but I never heard you actually speak to it, and I know that it's questions I've had in the past. Um, how do you identify quantity of shares initially, and, or is there like a best practice you've seen in that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's what that's what uh, this uh, this uh, growth fund is all about. The quantity of shares is taking the inputs that people have, their time, uh, their their going rate, how much you're paying them in cash versus stock. Now, there's an initial uh, allocation that, that may take place uh, where the founder would have, let's say, 30% of the stock. That's just because, or the idea person. And there's there's a lot of discussion around, let's say you've got uh, proprietary technology. How do, you, how do you pay that inventor uh, for their work? Well, it's royalties. It's a percentage of ownership. There's various ways to do it. But, uh, the, the point I'm trying to make is that you try to come up with objective inputs and you make it a dynamic process. And there may be an allocation in the beginning that, that is where you start from for the dilution. Does that make sense? The theoretical value. Yeah, and then also just how do you identify the initial, like a million shares or you know, things like the, that? The, the, just kind of random. Okay. The, 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 the shares are absolutely random. And it's part of a mathematical calculation that you need to get to, but it's it's uh, the shares become the numerator and the denominator for the percentages. But frankly, you are working off percentages and getting the resulting shares as a, uh, from the percentages. As a, so the shares really they really don't matter. Yes. So that's what you're saying. So what the exactly the the guy uh, he's going to the hundred and fifty dollar power. So he said his time would have been valued at uh, say two hundred thousand. But you agree that you're paying the set, so that means X and E now going to be the 130. Okay, so let's let's go with the, let's go with those numbers. Um, hundred dollars an hour, two thousand hours a year is two hundred thousand dollars. You're paying them fifty. So if they're working the whole year, two hundred thousand minus the fifty you're paying them gives you hundred and fifty. That you that is their theoretical input into the ownership pie, into the equity. Okay. And remember, it's not real. It's not a real day. It's the theoretical value that just gives you the percentages. That's all it is. But his value is not going to be 150%. This is merely a way to calculate the stock that you're issuing or promised to issue them. And uh, we didn't even talk about investing uh, and going off the cliff. I forgot who mentioned that. But, uh, Again, yeah, study this stuff and, and take advantage of my uh, time. I will uh, I will go in and if I answer a question for someone, I don't know how to get to it. Can you go back to the very second slide? Excuse me. Yes. What are you doing that? Um, in relation to his question, yes. uh, my understanding, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, yes. is that when you're initially creating your company, you determine how many shares are in the company. You can determine 100,000, a million, and that as time goes on if, and, you're, and you need more shares issued, you can issue more shares and maintain the same ratio. That really is a, a simplistic explanation that won't stand up. You, you really, when you when you do the mechanics of it, uh, just try to divorce yourself from number of shares calculation. It, it really, uh, it'll be, it's more confusing. I, I, I'd, I'd, uh, I would encourage you to go back to that site and read some about the division. 
to understand it a little bit more than maybe we can have a conversation. Can you go to that uh, first? Hold on, hold on, hold on. One second. Okay. Go to that first one. All right, let's see. I'm getting on. It's not where I want to go. Can you try that? Go to the second page. Click that. Click this link right here. Okay, good. All right. Now, go to Equity and Tax Questions and Answers Google Doc. This one right here. Google Doc? Yeah. Okay. This is what you'll get from me if you ask me a question. You'll you'll ask you'll ask a question. I'll put the question here and I'll put a link down to the answer. This is on entities. Should you be an LLC? Should you be a C corporation? Should you be a Delaware corporation? But when you ask me questions about this topic and you go back to the online resources. This is what you're going to see from you. All the questions will be on the top. The answers will be hyperlinked. And if there's an exhibit like this, uh, further e explanation of, you know, people are mad about uh, you know, uh, incorporating in Delaware. It's, it's silly for most people. We're done. Okay. Finish your thought. Yeah, we're done. Okay. That's it. All right, Link. Find his contact info at the meetup uh, page as well, and then maybe Andy can pull it up again. Um, Thursday, Capono, Florida Angel Nexus, talking about competitive. Uh, George that in, and then also next Monday is Intello. Uh, Mike Mason's a great story about uh, pivots, fantastic story actually. So uh, without further ado, thank you. This is Star Studio. Tell everybody about the Tuesdays and Thursdays for the next two months. Thank you. Thank you. So let's end the broadcast. I think it just ended.